She has proven she has guts. Does it matter that alone at a traffic light, our passionate dreamer finds herself breaking down in tears? Does it make a difference that she's terrified of the choice she has made, that she has to fight off nightly the overwhelming urge to pack it up and go home? All that matters is that she has taken action. She is here. She has left there behind. This does not go unnoticed by mortals or by the gods. Well, hello there and welcome to a very special episode of The Terry Cole Show. Have you ever wanted to do something in your life? Write a book, become an actor, do something, get your PhD, change careers. Well, if you do, then this episode is for you, my friend. I'm interviewing a close pal of mine, Stephen Pressfield. I'll tell you all about Stephen if you don't know him. We're talking about his book, Put Your Ass Where Your Heart Wants to Be. And it really is a step-by-step guide to outsmart your own resistance to do what it is that you really do want to do in your life. If you don't know Stephen, I'm going to tell you about him. He's a best-selling author, fiction and nonfiction. He's so talented. He wrote The Legend of Bagger Vance, Gates of Fire, The Lion's Gate. He also wrote The Classics of Creativity, The War of Art. If you have not read that book, oh my God, you must. He wrote Turning Pro and Do the Work. And his latest memoir is Government Cheese, which we talk about in this interview as well. And we talk about put your ass where your heart wants to be. He also, every Wednesday, has a creativity column. It's really like about writing that comes out every Wednesday at stephenpressfield.com. And it really is one of the most popular writing blogs on the web. It's amazing. The War of Art has sold millions of copies globally. It's been translated into a zillion languages. And my husband and I know Stephen because I, I knew his work prior to My husband, Victor, who is a very talented and established illustrator and artist, Stephen Pressfield got in touch with us and he and Vic did a book together called The Daily Pressfield, which is going to be coming out relatively soon, I think. And they just became really close friends, like two little peas in a pod. And recently in the past six months, Vic and I actually went out to Malibu to hang out with Stephen Pressfield and his girlfriend, Diana, and just spend time together because we became such close friends virtually. And now they're planning to come out here to Crackpot Farm at some point when they come out East. So this is really um, a treat for me. Stephen's been on the show before, but this is the first time I interviewed him after we went out to visit them. So it just is so lovely. I hope that you enjoy this interview and that this interview motivates you to put your ass where your heart wants to be. I am so excited to welcome back my pal, Stephen Pressfield, to the Terry Cole Show. Welcome back, Steve. Terry, it's great to be here. And uh, yeah, let's, uh, we're both digging out of rain and snow and let's do it. That's what I'm talking about. But right now, the tech gods are smiling on us. So this is pretty (laughs) exciting. All right. So many things to talk about. First, let's talk about put your ass where your heart wants to be. So this is a book that falls really under the self-help sort of category. Or what I like to say about your books about getting shit done, they're like the get it done category Uh. because you are the master of resistance. So I want to ask you, why, why now for this book? Um, you know, it's funny because that phrase, put your ass where your heart wants to be, has been, I was on Oprah Winfrey's show like about 10 years ago. And mm-hmm. I just, I, I looked at it again. I realized that I was using that phrase then. So it's been kicking around in my head for a long time. And I just thought, you know, it's funny how books sort of just sort of click into your mind when it's time to write them. And mm-hmm. I thought the idea of that, the idea of sort of physically sitting down you know, putting your ass in the chair where your dreams are, that the time was right for me to write about it anyway. And for the other, the deeper levels of, you know, the metaphorical levels of that concept. And also, as you know, Diana, my girlfriend and I, we just started our own little publishing company. And one of the things I think that, uh, you know, as you know, that sort of helps you in a, when you're coming off of a baseline of zero is to have a great title. Yes. And so I thought, 
you know, because nobody else knows anything about it, right? So I thought, oh, this is this is a title that might get people's attention. So that was that was why I did it. Well, you're, I mean, listen, all of your work speaks to me. All of, especially the stuff about resistance, which is such a bulk of your personal story. And it's funny, Vic and I listened to Government Cheese First, which is your memoir that's also wonderful that we're going to talk about in this episode. It is right here, you guys. If you're watching this, it's <laughs> a beautiful book. We loved it, but what's so interesting is that then going into Put Your Ass Where Your Heart Wants to Be after that, I saw how much you lived the principles that are in sort of the how-to book. So let's talk a little bit about what does it actually mean to you to put your ass where your heart wants to be? Well, there's, there's like a number of different levels, Terry. And the, the first one is, stop me when I'm just wandering too much here. The first one is like, if you want to write a book, people say, well, how do I write a book? Well, the answer is sit down in front of this, you know, put your ass where, you know, if you want to be a painter, get up in front of the easel, you know, if you want to be a dancer, get into the studio. So that's obviously like the first level of what put your ass means. Like, for instance, just as a sidebar, for years, I always wanted to go to the gym. I always kind of admired people that did that, you know, but I never could sort of get up the nerve to actually walk in with all these muscle men and muscle girls and everything. But the answer is you just put your ass in there. Just do it. Get up and get in there. Once you're in there, everything will sort of fall into place. But right. to sort of keep going a little bit. The second level of put your ass where your heart wants to be is the idea of maybe moving, leaving where you live and going to wherever the sort of the center is of your dream. Like Henry, Henry Miller, Ernest Hemingway, they went to Paris, right? Bob Dylan went to Greenwich Village. Joni Mitchell went to Laurel Canyon. And so if, if you have a dream, you know, if you want to be in the porn industry, you got to move to the San Fernando Valley. You know, that's where <laughs> that's where it is. But but also the idea of that once you're there, you meet people, you meet mentors and so on and so forth. The next metaphor beyond that is what is put put your ass really is about commitment. Put your commitment somewhere where it is. And once you do that, magical things start to happen from real human beings in, in your life, but also from heaven, from the muse. Things change in the universe. You know, your DNA yeah. changes and your vibrations change and good things start to happen. So I'll, I'll stop right there. It's, I, I never want you to stop, but yes, it, it's interesting. The, the, what comes to my mind when we're talking about what you're saying, it's like putting your stake in the ground. It's like, yeah. I say to my clients, it's like you're putting the universe on notice that like some shit is going to change because I'm changing <laughs> because I'm willing, you know, with my clients, a, a lot of times people will say, you know, they want to do this or like you said, how do you write a book? How do you, all of the things. And my first question is, what are you willing to do to get what you say it is you want? Like, what are you actually willing to do? So yes. I would love for you to tell us what you did when you moved out of New York, when you decided you wanted to be a screenwriter in Hollywood. What did you do when you were living in New York City? Well, the, the further story, the little backstory to that moment, and this is actually in my blog today that's out on the, the thing. The backstory to that moment was I had spent like the previous 10 or 12 years trying to write a no trying novels. I wrote three of them, none of them which got published, none of them even came close. And I was really at a kind of an all is lost moment of ready to like blow my brains out because this had been my dream forever, the only thing I had done. And uh, I knew I couldn't sit down for another four years or five years and write another novel that also was going to go absolutely nowhere. And my breakthrough, my flash of that was, okay, I give up on that. Let me go to Hollywood and try to make it in the, in the movie business. I thought, you know, I failed as a novelist. Let me go out there and fail as a screenwriter. Why, why not? You know? <laughs> but what I did, this really was a moment of, of absolute commitment. And just like I just said, sometimes you have to move to someplace, you know? So I packed up my ancient Chevy van and my cat 
my typewriter and went out there and just gave it everything I had, you know, and uh, it took like another five or six years before I finally actually started to make a little bit of money. But the gods see that, you know, they see you when you get in your car and they see you when you pack everything up and you leave everything behind and they say, well, maybe this guy doesn't have any talent, but yeah, damn it, you know, he's willing to put it on the line. So maybe we'll help him out a little bit. So that definitely was, you know, a big inflection point for me. So Not a final inflection point because my screenwriting career ended, you know, and then I moved on, you know, oddly enough, back to novels. So that worked out anyway. What's interesting about what you're saying, though, about the commitment and the moving and the you know, it's like magical, it's mystical. I'm not sure what to say. Like, I'm not sure how we can describe what happens. But, you know, I like to think of it as the universe is conspiring in our favor if we're brave enough to put our ass where our heart wants to be, where there are no guarantees. And, you know, Steve, what I think is amazing about your work and what is a a flow through of the the self-help work. I mean, I love your novels as well, but the self-help work itself is that you're so into the long game, right? You're like, uh. this is my life. Do your best. Vic and I were talking in the car this a couple of weeks ago, and we were talking about a series that you had on YouTube, I guess it was. It was, it was about the hero's journey, I think, and, and whatever we were talking uh. about. And he said something uh. that really struck him was about doing your best for yourself. That like, do your best. And even if no one else sees it, it's valuable to do your best. Does that make sense? Absolutely. I mean, I, I'm, I'm a complete believer in that. And uh, I'm sure you're familiar with Elizabeth Gilbert's famous, you know, 21 million view uh, TED talk mm -hmm. called Your Elusive Creative Genius, which if any of your viewers haven't seen it, they should. And she's a believer absolutely in that. And I am too. It's a, I'll give you another sort of story. Um, a few years ago, I had fallen off the wagon at the gym for like three months. I just hadn't gone. And I was like really down on myself on that. And I was talking to a friend of mine, a woman, who was also a gym person. And she said, you know what, Steve? She said, this is a lifetime commitment for you and me, you know, to fitness and to that sort of thing. So don't worry about it. Okay, you fell off the wagon for three months, you get back, it gets another 30 years, you know? And I do believe that in a way, because I failed to succeed for so long, for like 27 years, that I was sort of forced to ask myself, why am I doing this? Am I crazy? Why do I keep writing these things that nobody wants to read? Yeah. And uh, I finally just sort of answered myself and said, this is who I am, you know? This is the only thing that makes me feel good. Everything else, I'm so depressed. I try any other job, I can't keep it up. So I'm gonna keep doing this for its own sake. Yes and not for any rewards, you know? And I also think it's really great to hear, Terry, that you believe in the sort of airy-fairy stuff of the universe. Mm -hmm. I think the gods see that. Yep. They see that you're doing it for the right reason. Mm -hmm. You're not doing it just for money or whatever. Right. And they respond. And the way they respond is they give you ideas. Like you wonder, what's the next book? What's the next chapter? What's the next scene? And suddenly that idea comes to you. And when it didn't come before, right. so it, it is the long game. I mean, it's your whole life. Like my friend said, we're in this for a lifetime. Yes. Like Vic is, like you are, yeah. you know, that's a big decision to make. But once you make it, magic starts to happen. Without a doubt. It also, though, requires, it, it's a perspective shift because in thinking, yes. right, in thinking, like people will say to me, I want to grow my business. I want to have an online presence as you do. I want to do blah, blah, blah. And there, I literally met with someone one time and she was like, I want to be associated with the people that you're associated with. And I was like, I think that's the wrong want. How about mm. you find your people whose work inspires you, who you think are original thinkers, who are exciting you and energize you, and then see how you can be of service to them. Support their work. 
get in their world, see what they're doing, analyze them. And I know from reading Government Cheese, your memoir, that you are also such a student of life. So tell us a little bit, if you would, about what happened when you went to LA and you were having trouble getting arrested with your stuff. What did your agent suggest for you to do? Uh, no, it's interesting that you bring that up. So what finally happened after like maybe five years of writing screenplays and, and my agent was a good agent, couldn't sell any of them. He finally said to me, Steve, what if I pair you up with another writer? What if I make you part of a team? You know, you'll be the junior member, was another client of his who was like a name brand in Tinseltown, but at least you'll be getting jobs. You'll be getting them through your partner, through this established writer. So I said, sign me up. That was a big breakthrough for me too, where the guy that I was working with became a real mentor to me. He wasn't actually trying to mentor me, but I'd learned so much by uh, just watching how he worked. But again, I think that's sort of the gods do look down on you in a crazy sort of way. That would never have happened if I wasn't there in LA, right. busting my butt all day long. So that, that definitely was a thing. But one thing I want to say, Terry, just to go back to what what I was saying a little while ago was if anybody's listening to this and maybe interprets what I just said as like, you have to quit your job, you have to leave everything behind. That's really not what I mean. I think that you can be a hundred percent committed one hour a day mm -hmm. and it'll work. As long as you're committed, even for a short period of time a day, that works, that counts in heaven. So, it can be done, and I've done it, and a lot of people have done it that way too. I I love that so much because I do think that, you know, it's almost like we want it to be like I have to change everything, I have to shed all of the everything in my life, and if I'm going to make this massive change. But Steve, what you're really saying, and what is the truth of your lived experience, and the millions, hundreds of millions of people that you've taught at this point, is that it's about commitment. It's not about you have to do it all day long because as, as you, you point out in the book, like professionals don't, you know, someone who's yeah. going to the gym is not going to the gym for like 18 hours a day, even if they're yeah, bodybuilders, yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah. Like I think even myself now, like I'm a professional writer. I've been a professional writer now, make, you know, making my living, you know, like Vic as, a, as an illustrator, but I'm, mine is probably different than Vic. He can probably work longer than me, but I find that, even being a total pro and no, I don't have to go to any job. I wind up, in fact, only maybe working two or three hours a day. And I have to really work hard to carve that out, you know? So yeah. it's entirely possible to be a single mom, to be raising kids, you know, to have a job and carve out a couple of hours in the day. And you're actually on the same level with me, you know, because I've got so many other things happening, you know? Yeah. It's so true. I want to talk a little bit about something that I really love that you say, and I think it's really important about not having plan B. Let's discuss. Uh, well, sometimes uh, that's, a, that's another way of talking about commitment. You know, are you in it with both feet? Have you burned the boats? You know, um, yep. and it wasn't for me like I ever said to myself, okay, I'm not going to have a plan B. There's a lot of times I tried to have a plan B. I, I tried to go straight. I tried to get a regular job, you know, but, and I even got some regular jobs, but I was so depressed at the end of the day, there really was no alternative for me. It was the only thing that made me feel good at the end of the day was to do, to do my work, you know, even though nobody wanted it. So yeah. <laughs> sometimes it's a curse to have a lot of skills. You know, some people are good at a lot of things, which I'm not. I'm only good at one thing, which is really lucky for me. But it can be a curse if you're good at a bunch of things, because then you go, well, maybe I should do this. You know, I'm I'm really good as a salesman. Maybe I should be, you know, that kind of thing. You know, in the end, it's, you know, what your heart really calls you to, what your calling is, I think. I totally agree. It's funny. I used to teach acting at NYU years ago, and I would always know who the successful kids were going to be ah. because of how ah, they Let me would... ask you about that, Terry. How did you know? Sure. What was, what, what, how did you know? Well, I would teach them like on camera informational interviewing, right? So like when they go in and they're like, hey, tell us a little bit about yourself on camera. 
And the kids who I felt like were already embodying their future desires would say, I'm an actor. I'm from Ohio. I've been doing this all these years. Um, This is what I'm passionate about or whatever. The ones who I felt like were less obvious to be successful were the ones who said, I want to be an actor. Mm. Well, you don't, you're a senior in college. If you, why don't you already identify as an actor? The ones who were like this or bust, like I'm not. So, so the whole plan B thing, I would say to them, is there anything else that you can do that makes you happy at the end of the day? As you said, is there, is there anything else that you do? Oh, like I'm an actor, but I also love blah. The ones who would say, yeah, you know, I'm an actor, but I also love numbers. And so I'm an accounting minor and blah, blah, blah. I was like, oh, that person is a future accountant because their plan B is too <laughs> good. <laughs> right? Uh huh. <laughs> like, what are you willing to do? But it's also the mindset because someone at the age of 19 who's telling me I'm an actor, I'm like, you are. That's a fact. You just declared it to me and the gods and the universe Uh that that's what you are. Uh And so I think that with any process of what people are wanting to do, as you teach us in this book, it's really about what are you willing to do, but the perspective shift, how you see yourself, you identified as a writer, even though you had driven trucks and done other things and tried to do other things and tried to not only quote unquote, be that, but it was really, and is who you are. And I look at Vic and my husband and say the same thing. Vic says the same thing, Steve. You guys are like two little peas in a pod where he's like, (laughs) I couldn't do anything else. Like he'll look at other people and be like, oh my God, how do they do that? Of course, he doesn't look at his skill and see how amazing it is that he can do what he can do. Yeah, yeah. He just is like, yeah. thank God there was a market for what I do because I don't know what I'd yeah. be doing if there wasn't, you know? Uh, yeah. There's another sort of flip side to this too. I think if you think about the concept of resistance with a capital R, meaning mm-hmm. the that negative force that works against you, you know, sometimes I, I was on Rich Roll's podcast just a little while ago mm-hmm. and we started talking about what he wanted to do in the future. And he had a, he has a book that he wants to write. And I could see his face changed. Everything about him changed. And the overwhelming emotion was terror. And I could see, you know, that he was absolutely terrified to do this thing, you know, uh, something he'd wanted to do, you know. And so like you saying, when you could spot an actor, I said to him, you got, this is it. You got to do it. And, which is sort of the opposite of, of him saying, I'm a writer that I can, you know, although he's written a wonderful book called Finding Ultra. But sometimes mm-hmm. it's, it's when people are really terrified of something that you look at it and you go, ah, they're for real. Because the, right. the dream equates to the amount of fear you have of trying it. So when there's a ton of fear, that to me is always a good sign in somebody else and in myself. Yes, it's so true. I I went to a mastermind recently with, with a bunch of women. And one thing that the woman, Kathy Heller, said to me that was so profound is like, if you had a magic wand, and you could get all the stuff that you're working for, right? All the money in the world, all the endless trips, all the, whatever it is that you want. You could redo your entire <laughs> house and add another bedroom or whatever. Uh-huh. She's like, you would still effing do what you're doing because it is who you are. Like you literally, would you stop writing books? Would you stop teaching? Would you stop doing your own masterminds? I'm like, no, I wouldn't. And she's like, so since we know that, how do you change your mind so that you are loving the whole process, even the dark, even the scary, even the resistance, you know, just accepting it as a part of getting it done? And I was like, wow. Ah, that's a great one. Yeah. And so true. I think people sometimes think that once they turn the corner in a good way into the whatever their calling is, that it's going to be plain sailing from then on. But it's obviously not. It's still hell on earth. You know, you're still battering your <laughs> brains into the into the wall every day, right? I'm just reading a really wonderful book by Robert Greene 
if you're familiar with him, the 48 laws of power he wrote. And this book is called Mastery. And it's just talking about sort of, it's really kind of a lot like what government cheese is about. It's like a, the long, lifelong process of kind of apprenticing yourself and learning, you know, whatever it is you're trying to learn, like Vic did, and then finally moving away from whoever your mentor is and going on your own, that kind of thing. And one of the things he talks about is a concept from John Keats from The Poet called negative capability. Are you, are you aware of that? Have you heard of that one, Terry? No, I haven't. It's, it's really, it's a great one. The way Keats defined negative capability, and he said it was like an indispensable character that, characteristic that any, any entrepreneur or creative person had to have. And what he defined it as is the ability to be in the midst of self-doubt, in the midst of uncertainty, in the midst of hell, and yet Keep going forward, even though you it's like you can't see the North Star, you can't see the land that you're sailing towards, but the ability to keep going in that in those moments. When you say loving every part of it, that's mm -hmm. kind of the deal, you know? If you're Michael Jordan or Kobe Bryant and you know you've got, you know, you tore your Achilles, you know, that's hell on earth for the next, you know, eighteen months or two years. But it's the part of the process, right? It's part of the game. Right. Um, I love that. So to I be able to do that. Yeah. That, that whole idea, though, Stephen, is so, in a way, it's revolutionary because when it gets hard, the resistance and the inner critic and the, you know, all of that stuff that comes up yeah. really makes you want to quit. Like, it does. And I always look back at my own experiences. Like, what, what is the evidence of my life? tell me, am I going to quit on my dreams? Like I may quit. If, I'm not saying you, you can change your mind about things, right? Sometimes we do things and we're like, you know what? I don't want that. Or I'm yeah. going to course correct. And yeah. that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about giving up on the thing I know I want to do, writing the books and creating the courses or whatever. And that evidence that you know, you've survived every hard thing you've ever done. Uh, is it always perfect? No. Is it always super successful? No. But the thing is, you're not that fragile. Like, this is hard. Mm. And it, you st it's still a high class problem. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's a great one, Terry. I never even thought about it that way before. But it's weird that these sort of skills, they don't teach you in school. You know, <laughs> you have to sort of get it from mentors or from therapists or from friends or somebody you admire, you know, they don't teach you how to, how to keep going in the midst of difficulties and in the midst of self-doubt. And there's, that's just one of many, many skills that you sort of have to have and nobody teaches yes. it to you. Maybe your mom and dad do, you know, or they model it for you if you're lucky. I mean, maybe good work ethic was modeled. I want to, I want to read a quote quick. There's about 40 quotes I wrote down. I got to read some of them. We started talking. I just didn't read any. So I'm going to just read a couple. When you move your physical body to where your heart wants to be, your peers and potential mentors think at once that you are serious. They consider you one of them because you have committed to your dream. And that is so true. And that sort of covers what we were talking about with the moving to LA that this, this, quote from your book made me think about how we all have this sense that like everyone else got the inner office memo and somehow like we missed it. <laughs> and uh -huh. the reality is that that that's not it. If you think you belong, other people will think so too. And if you think you're on the outside or that you're not good enough or that you're letting your resistance win, I think that that's, that is true too, right? What comes off of you, the energy that you were talking about before mm -hmm. and how just that move, just moving yourself if you can. And then you say, if you can't, to move there in your mind. So would you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, I was thinking, you know, after I after that chapter about, uh, well, move to Paris or move to wherever, I was thinking about uh, like Stephen King, where he lives in, I guess he lives in Maine, and sometimes he yeah. goes to Florida in the, in the winter or something like that. He doesn't have to move for anywhere because he's got like his own personal hotspot of his own commitment. It's like he could drop him in Antarctica and, and you know, in a little ice hole or whatever, and he'd still be <laughs> doing his thing. 
So he, right. he generates his own, like William Faulkner lived his whole life, you know, in Oxford, Mississippi, you know, except when he came out to Hollywood briefly. He made Oxford, Mississippi his own Paris, you know. So now people make pilgrimages to Oxford, Mississippi, just because, right. you know, his energy was so strong. So definitely, right. you don't really have to always go to Paris. You can create a Paris in your mind. You can. And yet, I think that the, the advice of moving there is especially potent when you're starting, right? When, you, yeah, when you're definitely. starting and you're starting in a business that requires other people to believe in you, like writing, like acting, yeah. like dancing, like there's so many where you you will need someone who's going to help you open the door because they believe in you. And that is so much easier to create when you're in the actual physical place in the world, the geographic place where the actual friggin' thing is happening. Yeah. Yes. Right. I mean, I know sometimes um, people would say to me, well, I want to write for the movies. Um, and I said, well, where do you live? You know, I live in Indiana and I'm going to stay here. And immediately mm -hmm. in my mind, I think, well, forget it. You know, there's no chance <laughs> right. because, right. you know, You've got to be somewhere where somebody can pick up the phone and say, "We got. Hey, can you come in for a meeting tomorrow at Paramount right. at seven thirty? And and if you can, then everybody in the room says, "Oh, this person's for real. They're really here." So yeah, I agree right. completely, Terry. And that really happened to you in your life where you were out there, right? Because I can't remember which book it was in, but yeah. where but it happens to everybody that goes to any place like that. Yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> What, was yeah. it like they would have you come in and doctor script or what was it? Um, you know, things, it might be very different. It might be just, uh, we just want to talk to you or you right. have submitted a script to them and they want to meet you to see if you're crazy enough, if you're like the real deal, you know, if they can actually hire you to rewrite it. So can you come <laughs> in? Can we meet you? Can we see you face to face? That's kind of it what, makes a what difference. it was. But it, that's why in every business, right? I mean, if you're a dancer, they want you to come in. They want to look in your eye, you know, and say, yeah. is this person going to be with us on this project nine months from now when they're, you yeah. know, they've got plantar fasciitis and tendons or, you know, that sort of thing. Right. Um, okay. I want to talk a little bit, if I may. In the book, it says self-reinforcement keeps us committed over the long haul. So tell us a little bit about self-reinforcement, if you would. Actually, I'd really like to hear what you think about this, Terry, but I'll give you my version and you can. <laughs> All right. Um, I think self-reinforcement, this is another skill they never teach you. They don't teach you this in school, right? If you're any kind of an artist where where you're basically alone, you're basically, you're doing your work and then trying to find a, a market for it or whatever, you need some voice that is going to buck you up. You know, maybe it's your spouse Maybe it's your daughter, whatever it is. But in the end, it really can only be yourself. It's self-talk, right. right? It can only be that. And the process is like every day I sort of have a moment with myself where I kind of uh, buck myself up, you know, and I'll say, okay, you know, maybe you screwed up and this is today and that you didn't really do as well as you should have done. And you didn't get time to do that. But God damn it, you know, you were there and you were trying, you know. And, mm -hmm. and you need that sort of every day. And an athlete needs that, you know, an entrepreneur needs that, anybody needs. So self-reinforcement, self-validation is another skill they don't teach you in school, but that you absolutely need to have. And I'd like to hear what, what you think about that, Terry. Well, my interpretation of what you're saying, I think it's absolutely true, but it's almost like um, the opposite of resistance, right? So resistance, we have those negative thoughts in our brain. We have telling us we can't do it or that we're stupid or that we're bad or that we don't need to do the work today or that we're tired or you know, <laughs> resistance, of course, wears a million and seven masks. But with self uh, reinforcement, it's like being the good mother. It's like being mm. the helpful mentor. It's treating ourselves with a certain amount of holding ourselves in high regard, but having a certain amount of compassion when maybe we don't have the best day writing, that's okay because, hey, you still got your ass where your heart wants to be and friggin' wrote some words. So, so <laughs> let's take the win, right? Let's take the win where there's a win. 
Yeah. But, you know, the whole thing about looking outside of ourselves, and I see this a lot in my therapy practice, especially with women, it can happen where people pleasing and looking for validation elsewhere. And if one of my clients wants to change careers, she's worried about what will her father, who's a lawyer, wanted her to be a lawyer. She's been a lawyer for X period of time, but she really wants to be a mm. writer or a singer or whatever it is. And it's really considering like, who am I if I'm not pleasing my father, even as a grown adult? And the, the better question is, who am I if I'm self-abandoning to please my father when I'm a grown adult? Right? There, so anyway, that, that's my two cents on self-reinforcement. Yeah, I think that was a no, long way yeah, around the barn. So but yeah. this, this is another skill that they don't teach you in school, which is to listen to yourself instead of listen to all of the what you should be and what we want you to be and what your mom and dad thought you should be and et cetera, et cetera. They don't teach you that at all. It's, it's sort of, you know, the school of hard knocks teaches you that. <laughs> it's so true. But there's also an expectation. You know, Stephen, I feel like part of in knowing you, it's like your work ethic, right? You you have a particular work ethic for yourself. And again, we, we've been talking quite a bit about Vic in this interview or referencing him because uh -huh. there's so many similarities in you have an expectation that you will do the work, not that your friend will do you a favor. And hey, maybe your friend will do you a favor, but you're not banking on that as like your plan to get your next book, you know, let's say if you were still needed to worry about your next book, yeah. but you don't, yeah. you know, and, mm -hmm. and Vic is the same. And I think that the, the work ethic piece of this, when it comes to putting your ass where your heart wants to be, it's so clear in the book that you're also saying, we have to do the work. Now the work doesn't have to be 15 hours a day. If that's what you think it has to be, that's not accurate, but it's consistency is queen when it comes to this. Yes, absolutely. And another sort of thing, like before, when you were talking, Terry, about like somebody saying, uh, I'm an actor, right? Even though they're maybe only 19 years old, like for years, I couldn't say to myself, I'm a writer. Because mm -hmm. it was, right. you know, I thought I'm not worthy of, of that. And I don't think it's possible to just sort of do affirmations and believe it. Mm -hmm. I think what it's, it's a two part thing. You really have to do the work. It's like at some point for me, after like 25 years of beating my brains out, you know, the typewriter, I finally did say, to, you know what, Steve, you are a writer. You know, you've sacrificed, you've given up this, you've worked, you know, you've earned it. Work is the secret to everything, if you ask me. You know, there's no way to do it without it. And, but with it, you really can't fail if you just keep going. Right. Just don't quit. In the book, it says the law of resistance is that it is strongest at the finish. Tell us a little bit about that. It's sort of a truth, a principle of th this negative force that I call resistance with a capital R. This was my nemesis for years that I'd get to the end of a project. I'd get to the, like the one yard line yeah. and I'd choke. You know, I'd fumble the ball. I'd, you know, I'd self-destruct. I'd act out, you know, in therapeutic terms, yep. you know, I'd <laughs> cheat on my wife, you know, yep. that kind of thing. Yep. And it was all fear, fear of, of actually finishing something and having it out in the world to be judged. The danger of somebody saying, you put your heart and soul into this and it really sucks, you know, yep. but resistance is always strongest at the finish line. You know, there's a story that uh, I read about uh, Michael Crichton, the author mm -hmm. of Jurassic Park and the Andromeda strain and all that sort of stuff. When he would get towards the finish of a book that he was working on, he would start getting up earlier and earlier in the morning. You know, he'd start getting up at four o'clock at three o'clock at two o'clock and it would drive his wife crazy. And finally he would just move out of the house and he would go check into a hotel. This is at the finish of a project. And what was really going on was his resistance was getting high, high, really, really high to try to make mm -hmm. him sabotage himself. So he sort of counteracted that by saying, I have to raise my intensity. You know, I'm going to go to a cabin in the yeah. woods. I'm going to chain myself to my typewriter to get this goddamn thing done. You know, <laughs> right. but it is it is at the finish. It, resistance is really high for anything. It's so that's, I love that story so much because I see it in myself so much too, where 
And it's so, so funny because I just recently listened to both of these books back to back. So you've been taking up lots of space in my head. It's been lovely, uh -huh. but I've been thinking about your words about resistance and it's been really helpful to not avoid like I, I would say to myself, like, what what are you avoiding? Why are you not blocking time? Like I have a book due, right? September 1st. <laughs> <laughs> ah. And I, you know, deadlines, it's about yes. half. Yeah. Oh my God. Speak, speaking of deadlines, one more quote, and then I'm going to finish the story. And then I want you to read a little passage. So this quote, because it actually is about deadlines from the book, put your ass where your heart wants to be. Making a simple commitment not to miss deadlines helps us immensely. Once we agree on a deadline, we no longer have to worry about it. We no longer have to negotiate, come up with excuses, or even stress about it. And I really took this to heart. And normally, everything I do is in my calendar, whether it's working out, whether it's, I mean, I don't have to take a shower in there, but I should. Like anything uh -huh. that's going to get done in my day is right in the calendar. But what I've noticed is that I don't know how, but suddenly my writing blocks are not in there. Hmm. That's mm. funny. Why? Interesting. Uh -huh. I don't. Yeah. So I actually yeah. today I just put them all back in and I was like, uh, get uh -huh. it together, girl, because they're uh -huh. not. I already I already got one extension on this book and uh -huh. I do not think I'm getting another one. So anyway, uh -huh. all of this is very timely for me right now, Stephen. Yeah. Well, here's another sort of thing that they absolutely don't teach you is this skill to like to know in advance when you start your book or whatever it is, whatever project it is, to be able to say to yourself, okay, at the finish, I know I'm going to run into a buzzsaw. It's kind of like hitting the wall in a marathon. The concept of that is that at 22 miles in a marathon, apparently, the fuel that you've used to run, muscle glycogen, runs out. And the body has to switch over to burning fat. And what happens is at that moment, your legs go completely dead and you feel like the world is, is ending, right? The way runners overcome that is at the start of the race, they say, okay, I know at mile 22, mile 23, I'm going to hit the wall. So when I start experiencing that, don't panic, you know, just dig deep, hang in for like another 90 seconds and the body will switch over to burning fat, you know? So it's the same thing, I think, at the end. I'm sure Michael Crichton, he probably books the hotel, you know, nine months in advance. And right. it's just ready to face it. Again, it's a skill they don't teach you. It's a trick, right? That a mentor right. would say, hey, be ready for that because it's going to happen. And, and yes. it does, infallibly. Yes. and to So I hope you get those that. writing blocks in there, Jerry. You know I will, Stephen. I will be calling you directly. Yes, I know you Saying, will. help me. Yeah. Why am I doing it? Um, but I think that there's there's truth in what happens when we can be prepared for that sort of pushback. We go, oh, this is resistance. I knew it was coming. This is how I planned. I don't know that we need to be like Michael and go get a cabin in the woods, but there uh -huh. are things that we can do to hold ourselves accountable. I can let my team know, hey, I'm really feeling this way. I probably took the writing blocks out of my calendar because I was traveling and I was like, I'll put them back in. And then I didn't, but mm -hmm. I need to, because I need to, I need to keep moving, but it's also getting support from other people. And again, expecting the end to run into a buzzsaw, as you said, resistance to be at its very height. If we don't want to be derailed. And you know, Steve, what I love about this book, this is for anyone who wants to do anything like, literally, because resistance comes up when we want to do anything that matters to us, anything that makes us like the ritual terror. It's like, this is this process that you've shared. It's just so valuable. You guys, the book, you can get it anywhere and everywhere. Before I have Stephen read a passage that I love from the book, Steve, where can everybody find you? They can find me on uh, on Instagram, and also I have my own website and a blog that I do every Wednesday called Writing Wednesday, which is like another chapter That's from great. the War of Art. So it's just my name, Stephen Pressfield. You can find me there. I'm I'm pretty I'm everywhere. Yeah, you are, buddy. And, um, okay, do you and, would you would you read a little a little excerpt from the book for us? I'll say, listen, I love the entire book, but the, I actually had tears coming out of my face when I read this passage 
about, well, I'll, I'll let you read it, but it really resonated with me about the, the stick to itness, the commitment to self that what happens when we do it. But, but I felt very seen. It's funny. I reading uh-huh. this, I felt very like, yes, I am her. So go. Ah, uh-huh. uh-huh. so this is really sort of under the subject of um, self-reinforcement and the, um, it's, it's about a, a woman. And in my imagination, it's like maybe an actress or a dancer who has committed, left her hometown and gone to the big city, wherever it is. And she's having moments of doubt and wondering, did she do the right thing? So here's the passage. She has proven she has guts. Does it matter that alone at a traffic light, our passionate dreamer finds herself breaking down in tears? Does it make a difference that she's terrified of the choice she has made, that she has to fight off nightly the overwhelming urge to pack it up and go home? All that matters is that she has taken action. She is here. She has left there behind. This does not go unnoticed by mortals or by the gods. So good. It was so re- it was so uh, reassuring. I was like, okay, this is great. Oh, Stephen, I love you. I so appreciate all the work that you're doing, all the time we've spent, all the friendship, all the stuff. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Great, Terry. Thank you. I love you too. And say hi to Vic for me. Thanks for having me on the show. And I hope this was helpful to uh, to your peeps. It certainly was, as always. Thanks, my friend.